Hello, everyone. I'm Janet Salmons, Research Community Manager for Sage Method Space, and I'm pleased to be joined today by Martin Hebel, who's going to talk about sample selection in systematic literature reviews. Um, his work is in management research, but we'll talk about how these ideas apply in a variety of fields. Um, we're having this interview as a part of a feature that um, will focus on a special collection in the Organizational Research Methods Journal that includes Martin's uh, article and a whole collection of other terrific uh, research in this area. But before we get started, um, if you are new to Method Space, this is a research community sponsored by Sage Publishing. We're interested in everything to do with designing, planning, conducting, analyzing research, writing about it, sharing results. And you can see um, at the center of this diagram, we have teaching and learning because we think that whether you are a brand new researcher or an experienced researcher, we all have something to learn. And that's certainly why I enjoy doing uh, these kinds of interviews and having a chance to meet with uh, researchers around the world. So Martin, why don't you just begin by uh, introducing yourself? Thank you, Janet. Um, yeah, I'm Martin. I'm from the University of Siegen. I'm a professor of management accounting and control at this university and also a visiting professor at Johannes Kepler University in Linz. And yeah, so I'm usually from the field of uh, from accounting, but in, in this piece, I have also ventured into management research and review methods in management research. We're going to uh, walk through some uh, of your slides about uh, th this kind of review research and the, in particular, the concept of sampling. So why don't you just uh, start and, and, you know, I may ask you some questions along the way. Yeah, sure. Um, well, there has been quite some increase in, in published systematic reviews of, of management research in the last two decades, actually. And this has mostly started with this um, seminal paper by Tranfield and colleagues published in 2003. And there have been, I guess, hundreds or even thousands of papers that have built on this one uh, for conducting systematic reviews. But at the same time, the methodological advice on how to conduct those systematic reviews has not grown as swiftly, I should say. So I saw some room for giving fellow researchers and especially more junior researchers some more guidance in terms of choices or, or what to consider in systematic reviews. And in this specific paper, I focus on sample selection within those mm -hmm. systematic reviews. So such sample selection procedures, they cover questions that are put on this slide here also. For instance, you ask yourself the question as a researcher, should I conduct a keyword search, for instance, in certain databases or how to choose databases in the first mm -hmm. place? Or should I rather search in selected journals only? Uh, should I focus on a certain time period in my review mm -hmm. research? Or should I also include quality assessments in my sample selection process? And these and other questions, they have not, you know, Mm -hmm. been answered, but I don't provide definite answers to, uh, but I provide a discussion of what to consider when these questions arise during your review process there. I agree that the methodological advice on this topic has been really limited. So that's why I was pleased to see this whole special collection in the Organizational Research Methods Journal. But in particular, you know, the topic of sample selection, I mean, I... I've written around this topic myself and, and really have found very little discussion of it. I mean, we, we talk about sampling in terms of population and um, research participants, but what about documents, archives, or even where to start, or as you say, you know, which to go with. So let's walk through some of the, um, some of the things that you've found and, and discussed here. So situating the selection, um, Tell us about the stages. Yeah, so so that picture is actually taken from this uh, Tranfield and colleagues uh, paper, uh, and they view research or review research as 
being built upon three main stages. So the first would be planning the review where you kind of motivate your, your review research, where you also develop a certain research questions where, um, mm -hmm. or question, which is guiding your review research. In stage two, you would focus on actually conducting your review research. And in stage three, uh, this is all about reporting, for instance, writing a chapter in your mm -hmm. thesis or or trying to publish your your review paper as a standalone paper in a nice journal. But what I focus on here is actually stage two and okay. uh, some specific phases within stage two. So my paper is mostly focused on phases three, four, and also to a certain extent to uh, phase five, where you identify research that could be relevant to your guiding research question, mm -hmm. where you then select those studies. And this selection process might also include some quality assessments. And then you have a review sample, actually. And then you could also disclose the individual research items that are part of your review sample. So, uh you know, continue on with this uh, in terms of the attributes of a sample selection. So, you know, we're, you know, basically saying here, you know, assuming that you have a clear question and you've, you know, you're now ready to go and try to find um, the published sources you're going to consider, uh, you know, for inclusion in your study. So tell us more about this. Yeah, so so prior studies or prior methodological advice on systematic reviews, um, they have come up with with various attributes or desired attributes that so such systematic reviews should follow. Um, and I have I have well summarized these attributes from prior literature into three attributes which I use in, in this paper. And the first of those attributes is structured. And structured doesn't apply only to sample selection, but structured applies to the whole process of conducting systematic reviews. So structured means in this connection that such a systematic review should not you know, be kind of um, half a sard or it should be conducted in a random way, but should be in an ordered way. And for me, I have kind of translated this um, more general statement uh, into the requirement that that all steps taken during sample selection, but also during the other parts of systematic reviews, those steps should be well explained, founded, and should not be arbitrary. So this also applies then to the sample selection process. And the second attribute I I have found and I use in this paper is comprehensive. Mm -hmm. So systematic reviews should cover all relevant research items. And here, this word relevant makes makes all the difference, actually, because you cannot cover all the research items that could potentially be, be useful for your research questions, but you should only cover those that are really relevant. Mm -hmm. And for, for judging on relevant, you have actually two questions to answer. So the first would be, which is here uh, denoted with A, is that relevance could be found if a certain research item helps you as a review researcher to answer your research question. Mm -hmm. So a relevant item, of course, should include some information that is relevant to the review question. And the second one is that there might be additional inclusion or exclusion mm -hmm. criteria, which should be disclosed, of course, in those uh, systematic reviews. And you can use those criteria to additionally judge on whether mm -hmm. a certain piece is relevant mm -hmm. because those review questions that are guiding systematic reviews, they might be short or not, you know, pages long. So um, those questions are short and therefore they cannot include every criterion. Mm -hmm. So you can define additional criteria for inclusion and exclusion that should be followed then mm -hmm. and Following these criteria, you can also judge on whether a research item would be relevant or not to your review. Yeah, and the third one is transparent. This also applies to systematic reviews more generally. Uh, and in the special case of sample selection, transparent means that, for instance, the final review sample, so the review sample is the collection of research items that you have found to be relevant to your research question that also follow your inclusion criteria. So all those 
research items that you want to analyze or synthesize within your mm -hmm. systematic review, they build what I call the review sample. And for allowing fellow researchers or readers more generally to kind of understand how you have selected your studies and what studies are actually the basis for your results, then it's important to also disclose the final review sample and also the other methodological steps to arrive at this sample. Um, there's sometimes, you know, the, the requirement voiced in literature that those systematic reviews should be, um, well, replicable. Yeah, but probably that's a bit uh, too much for the social sciences because you still have some mm. kind of discretion as an author what to include or what not to include. But the criterion here would be, and this is here in the last point here on this slide, is that your sample selection should be as transparent as possible so that fellow researchers can actually, or as good as possible, trace the sample selection you have followed. Okay. So then... Uh... In this slide, you know, looking at how you put those pieces together in your process for, for going about the sampling. Yeah, so um, as you can see on the, on the left-hand um, side here, so what's what's central to any systematic review, but to any piece of research more generally, is a, is a research question or research questions. And those questions also guide systematic reviews. So everything else is dependent actually on the research question here. And as I've indicated before, I have basically three process steps that are part of the sample selection process. Uh, so these are the identification of, of potentially relevant research items. Then you usually end up with a long list of potentially research or potentially relevant research items. Mm -hmm. So those lists could include uh, up to thousands of research items. And then you need to make sure how to really choose those that are relevant mm -hmm. to research questions. So this is all part of the screening process then where you go through all the, the research uh, hits or the search hits, and then you decide on whether to actually include a specific piece of research in your review sample or not. So this is all done in the screening process. And finally, you, as I mentioned before, disclose the, the final review sample. And for all these process steps and also the more detailed elements of these process steps, I, I think it's important to, to rely on those desired attributes, which we've talked about before, structured, comprehensive, and transparent. And if I just go in one or two more detailed elements here. So in the identification phase, you basically search for literature, but you can also or already apply some, some non-content related inclusion and exclusion criteria. So what do we mean by those non-content related criteria? Well, um, as I have framed these in this paper is that those are criteria which you can judge upon without actually looking into the individual research paper. Mm -hmm. So without looking into the method section or the result section or whatever, you can apply those criteria just by meter information on a certain piece of research. For instance, some researchers have focused on certain timeframes within their, their reviews. So for instance, the, the last 10 years or so. Mm -hmm. um, so this would be a non-content related criterion or another example would be whether you um, only include research that is published in certain journals or in journals that adhere to some minimum mm -hmm. ranking or so, yeah, that would also be a, a non-content related criterion. Whereas in the screening process, at least as I've put it in the, in the paper here, is that there you really go deeper into mm -hmm. the potentially mm -hmm. relevant research items. So you look into the content of those research items, and then you can apply, of course, content related um, criteria there. Right, and the, you know, thinking through this kind of a process, you know, would help with your search process because if we think about doing a search in a digital database where we have the chance to add in some of those parameters for the non-content and the content-related uh, 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 criteria, you know, that you know, thinking through those will, I think, say, save researchers a lot of time. So. Um, just want to talk through uh, some of these ideas. Yeah. Um, so I think 
these are these are the the methods I applied actually. But mm. um, this is actually an example of of how such a search could be conducted. So um, as part of this identification process, I have I have found that there are actually well for for approaches to search and and I have used a a journal driven approach in in my paper here so mm. I have not gone into a electronic database in the first place but I have selected two journals yeah which are quite prominent in the management field for for publishing review articles mm -hmm. and so I have defined those those two journals up front and then I I went actually through all published papers in these two journals for a certain time frame so between 2004 and 2018, and that's important to to not just state this time frame, but to really uh, explain why this time frame is, is useful here. And in this case, um, the time frame is is set because 2004 is the first year after this this trend field that all paper has been published. Mm -hmm. So it's been actually the first year that you could have expected to, a systematic review to mm -hmm. be based on this trend field paper. So this is why 2004 was the starting year year. And uh, 2018 was just the, the last full year that was available when I when I did this um, this analysis here. Um, so that's a time frame question, and I and I kind of also needed, of course, a kind of um, yeah inclusion criterion for what I consider as systematic reviews. Mm -hmm. So I defined in in for me here is that uh, those papers are regarded systematic in my analysis if they disclose inclusion or exclusion criteria uh, themselves. So if mm -hmm. they have some information on how they selected articles to be included in their reviews. So this was one criterion. Another criterion was rather an exclusion criterion was that I didn't include bibliometric analyses because um, they are not perfectly comparable to other systematic forms of review because they usually cover a much larger number of of research items into the hundreds or even thousands. Mm -hmm. So this is not what I wanted to include. I rather focused on those reviews which have a systematic way of, well, selecting their own pieces of research, mm -hmm. um, but still relying on a narrative analysis of those of those research items. All right. right. So for, for someone who's choosing the kind of journal-based yeah. focus, well then, you know, you're looking at, you know, you know, what are what are the uh, criteria for inclusion in that journal? I mean, does it include? Is it a global journal that with you know co contributions from all over the world, or is it uh, you know one one part of the world? You know, what what kind of uh, professional uh, focus or disciplinary focus? You know, how they define that? So that you know kind of gives you some kind of inherent. Um, criteria there if, if you decide to go that route yeah so it, it again it, i guess it depends on the, on the research question all mm -hmm. these questions that you mentioned i think also rely on to a certain extent on the the research question you have for mm -hmm. your systematic review so for instance um, in those reviews i analyzed and uh, these were more than 230 reviews i i analyzed more closely there um so they're all you know, different fields within the large field of management research, mm -hmm. uh, which also kind of defines the, mm -hmm. the journal selection if you go for such a journal-driven approach. Uh, there are some general management journals which appear very often in, in these uh, journal-driven approaches, but um, the more, you know, field journals probably, yeah, they really uh, depend on if you've got a question which is uh, going into entrepreneurship or going into marketing or also mm -hmm. going into sustainability issues. So the more field journals, then they really mm -hmm. uh, depend on, on your research questions, which journal to select. But for sure, you usually select the, the most regarded or highly, most highly regarded journals and, and not necessarily uh, marginal journals. So then um, here uh, you talk a little bit about how you work with those journals and what the actual analysis process was. Yeah, that's that's just more like uh, concerning the details of what I did. Um, but um, uh, it's really like methods I applied and not so much uh, mm -hmm. to be generalized uh, for other reviews, I mm -hmm. guess, yeah. So um, here, you know, you've, you know, we talked a little bit about the journal-driven approach, but yeah. here you, you mentioned some, 
additional options. So database driven, um, you know, which of course would depend on the databases to which you have access in your own academic libraries. Uh, then, you know, if you're looking for those, you know, kind of foundational seminal work, then that, you know, kind of provides a different uh, kind of lens or, you know, how you might mix those uh, depending on what your, what your question is. Yeah, exactly. So, so what what I have done actually was it was more the, this journal driven approach, um, where you start with the selection of journals, but this has also the potential downside that you do not include other pieces of research that might be relevant to your research question, actually. So, and at the same time, this is, I guess, the the most important strength of the database driven approach, where you don't select journals in the first place, but uh, yeah go to a database such as EBSCO, Web of Science, or, or Scopus, for instance, in, in the field of management, those are very important, uh, but also for other fields, I guess. So you go to a database and you enter keywords. Of course, those keywords should be well thought through as well and depend on your research question, but you openly search for, for search or for research that is relevant to your research question. And then afterwards you can still decide on whether you want to apply certain quality criteria to to filter through those results but it's really about what's the starting point and starting point for database driven approaches is that you define keywords that you go to a um, search database mm -hmm. and then you can also often find research that is relevant to your research question but research that you wouldn't have thought of as being relevant for instance mm -hmm. research from other fields from adjacent fields or right. from other fields you wouldn't have even thought of that they would be relevant and this is actually well a an advantage of this approach that it really fosters kind of interdisciplinary well knowledge flows i'd say um mm -hmm. and at the same time it, it has the downside that you as i mentioned before that you usually come up with long lists of potentially relevant research items where you need to skim through those and really find some clear criteria for how to select individual studies or not. Yeah. So that's uh, more labor intensive probably because you have just more search shows hits usually right. for this database driven approach. Yeah. Right. So this is where some of those non-content related criteria such as timeframes or um yeah. even geographic or more specific field oriented uh, criteria would help you to avoid getting the you know, 5 million uh, hits, you know, kind of a uh, response where, you know, then you've got to, you know, sort sort through those. Exactly. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's uh, go on, you know, a little bit more with the, um, you know, so as we say, you know, organizing all of the things that I think you've talked about are uh, re very helpful for organizing the process and thinking through, uh, some of these kinds of questions in advance so that you aren't just simply, you know, buried underneath a mountain of uh, stuff that you've got to read through, which, you know, could be very frustrating and time consuming. And, and also potentially, at least I know what it would do for me is then takes you down like, oh, well, that's interesting. And so mm. then like, you know, two hours later, you know, you've gone off in some other uh, complete direction. So, you know, being, you know, this uh, kind of a thoughtful organization can be, I think, very um, help you to stay focused and right. keep moving forward. So then um, here, I think you outlined some very uh, useful uh, choices researchers can make. So maybe we'll just kind of briefly go, go through this these slides with the sure sure uh, i think we've already talked about the the principal search approaches so um those are found here at the at the bottom um part of the slide but um what what could be interesting also is is if you have like uh, quite a lot of research hits is and this is uh on the on the bottom part here is that you sometimes also found an approach that you only focus on the most cited research items, for instance. So if you have a research question where you want to find out what is really defining a certain mm. research field, what has been the most influential stuff there, then you might go for such citation-based uh, selection criteria also mm. or screening criteria. 
um, where you only, so like for instance, the the most cited items per year or per decade mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. overall mm-hmm. from your time frame. So this might also help uh, for for narrowing down your your list of potentially relevant research items. But again, uh, what is really important here that uh, that fellow researchers they find a good fit between the research question and between the criteria they apply. Right. Uh, you can you can use those citation citation criteria if you have a research question that asks for the most important or the most influential mm-hmm. research items or research pieces in a certain field. But you cannot apply those if you have a very general question where you just um, ask, for instance, what has been going on in entrepreneurship research lately or so. So right, you really, right. need to, really need to predefine that you want to focus on those mm-hmm. um, most influential pieces in your research question already. So then you have afterwards, you have a good grounding or good basis mm-hmm. for, for using those citation-based uh, screening criteria. Yeah, that's about the organization of the, the screening process. So um, what I found interesting here and in, in some of the papers I looked at, they apply a certain ABC logic, as they call it. So where you have a long list of research items and you need to, well, judge on their relevance for your research question. Some uh, of those review articles, they applied this ABC logic, where A stands for those papers that are definitely relevant to the research question should be kept in the review sample. B are somewhat questionable, so you're not too sure about their relevance, and C is definitely not relevant. And this ABC logic is especially powerful when you have not only one researcher skimming through those lists, but two or more researchers, so mm-hmm. when you're actually a research team. So if you, if every individual researcher applies those ABCs to the potentially relevant research items, then you can afterwards compare those mm-hmm. A um, those C's and for those I think it's pretty pretty straightforward what to do with them so the A's would be included the C's would not be included and to really focus your discussion then on the B's where you're mm-hmm. not sure or where you might also mm-hmm. have um, different views about the relevance of those mm-hmm. pieces for your research question yeah that's well the focus on empirical non-empirical is also something that you could already define in a research question but it's not always done that way so you could also say uh, whether you only want to focus on empirical or non-empirical research items mm-hmm. but i think it's important to disclose this choice um some of those articles i looked at didn't disclose it's it's just important for the reader to be mm-hmm. able to trace the sample selection to really disclose this choice as well yeah and then and of course there's this question of of quality assessments where where quite some of those reviews I looked at, they have kind of bypassed this this question by by using journal rankings, mm-hmm. but uh, and and for instance included only A and B journals or so, and excluded C or 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 D or whatever journals. Yeah, um, this this is doable, and it's actually uh, of course a a convenient way of of narrowing down your research uh, items list. But at the same time, it's also it could be problematic because you're kind of outsourcing the decision mm-hmm. on whether something is is good in terms of quality to the authors of such rankings. So in the method literature, this uh, these quality assessments based on rankings are are often seen as problematic. Um, so you can of course do it on your own, and there are available quality frameworks and checklists you can apply for doing the quality assessment on your own. Mm-hmm. And I give some examples in the paper there. Uh, but of course, it's it's more labor uh, if you do it on your own mm-hmm. than when relying on, on available journal rankings. And another thing that is important here, I think, uh, is, is the very last line here. So beware of research that has been published in, in predatory journals um, because uh, some, and especially the earlier um, articles I looked at here, uh, they had as a quality criterion that a research items needs to be published in a peer reviewed journal. Yeah, mm-hmm. but this very label peer reviewed, I think it cannot be trusted anymore, as compared to twenty or thirty years ago, probably, because also those predatory journals, journals that would publish anything on a on a pay for publication scheme or so. Uh, they also state on their websites that they are peer reviewed or they do have peer review processes in place. But actually, they have not. So they just publish anything for money. 
And so this criterion peer review journal, I think it's just not reliable anymore. Mm -hmm. And it's probably better to, to rely on rankings there at least for, to sort out those okay. journals that are really not reliable. Right. Right. And I, I think, you know, it gets, you know, a little bit tricky, you know, in some fields, especially if you're looking at emerging and kind of contemporary new issues, we think about, you know, at, at, at this time, well, you know, before the COVID pandemic and after the COVID pandemic, for some social researchers, you know, would make a world of difference. Well, yeah. it's those things that are more recent, maybe, you know, they, they uh, uh, you, you know, they're, they're not going to have the, the massive citations and those kinds of things. So then right. think, well, what kind of quality assessments are you going to use if you're looking at you know, at some of those emerging uh, kinds of issues. And in terms of the non-empirical, well, you know, might you include, um, I mean, when, when I was doing my dissertation research long ago, uh, the, in my literature review, one of the problems I had was that there wasn't very much written about what I was yeah. wanted to study. And so then I found that there, I could find um, more thoughtful pieces in, professional writings that were reporting on what was happening right now. So then, you know, if you're going to go to some of those other kinds of sources, you know, what, what kind of quality is, uh, standards, you know, would you be looking for? I mean, in my yeah. case, I was looking at like, say something like the Harvard Business Review or the MIT Sloan um, Management Review, you know, that I felt like, well, those are associated with credible institutions and the people who are writing are also you know, researchers, you know, they're not just somebody who just thought this today and it was, you know, an opinion on somewhere. But, you know, those are all questions, you know, to consider depending on what your uh, what your criteria is and, and what your question is. Yeah, exactly. And, and those are excellent points you mentioned, I think, uh, especially for, for emerging topics or emerging fields even, yeah. Um, you might need to really venture into what is often termed the gray literature, such right. as um, professional reports or also book chapters or, or research reports uh, published from, from practic, uh, practical institutions or, or practice organizations. So um, I think as long as you, as you really uh, explain why you have looked mm -hmm. into those, and really give reasoning why this is necessary because it's such an emerging field. I think that's fine, yeah? and that's also that's also done by some uh, some prior uh, reviews. Um, in terms of uh, assessing the quality, it's I agree it's it's much harder for those uh, various other pieces uh, than than general literature. Uh, but again, I think those quality frameworks uh, and checklists that are used in some of those um, reviews I I looked at they can be helpful here too because. They are um, sometimes, or they include quite general things such as, does this research have a, a clear research question? Does it use mm -hmm. a theory or is it theory led or is it like um, theory, um, theory driven or kind of, um, is it trying to, to create theory? Yeah? Um, is it like, is there a clear findings part or are, are results discussed clearly? Are, are methods discussed clearly? So these are general questions that mm -hmm. are included in such quality frameworks that can also be applied to more emerging research where you cannot rely mm -hmm. on readily available research rankings or journal rankings. So I think it's doable, but it's definitely more work if you, mm -hmm. if you don't rely on, on journal rankings. Uh, okay. And I think we've, we've talked about, about uh, the need yeah. for transparency, uh, yeah. you know, you've discussed that. Um, so, uh, you know, I want to uh, thank you for uh, explaining these options. I think it will give uh, our readers, you know, a lot to think about, and you know, will help them to to create, you know, higher quality reviews, whether they are. Um, using that review as a part of a proposal or for part of their dissertation or thesis or, um, you know, creating a, a publishable a review article. Yeah, yeah, I hope so. Yeah, <laughs> I'd hope it helps some researchers and and in case yet yeah, you have some some open questions or or things that are not really covered in my um, in my PCR and um, I would be happy to to get in contact if if any additional questions come up when doing research there or review research. Thank you.